Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just to introduce today's speaker, a colleague of many within the department and a friend of many, uh, Associate Professor Michael Holmes. Uh, Michael is a pharmaceutical physician, epidemiologist, and has great expertise in genetic studies, um, which he's going to describe today. Um, in addition, some of you may also have had the opportunity to hear some of his recent named lecture awards, which uh, you might have seen at, for example, the British Cardiovascular Society. So it's a great privilege to have him speak to us today. Michael, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Um, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to give the seminar. Um, so I'm going to talk about evaluating biomarkers and therapeutic targets for cardiovascular disease through applications of human genetics. And I think, I mean, many in the audience will, will know these um, statistics, but it's worth just emphasising that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally. And if we look at what's happened from 2000 to 2019, the numbers of deaths that has actually increased from both ischemic heart disease and stroke. And certainly this has occurred in the background of reductions in death from communicable disease. And while for last year, this year, and perhaps for a few more years, we will see deaths arising from SARS-CoV-2 within the top 10 causes of death, I think it's fair to say that over the long term, ischemic heart disease and stroke will strengthen their position as the leading cause of death globally. So at the moment, they account for between them over 50, 15 million deaths per year. Three in every 10 deaths is due to cardiovascular disease. And the majority actually occur in low, low and middle income countries. And I think this is worth um, 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 reminding ourselves about, especially when we think about development of, of preventative and therapeutic approaches so that we develop those that are translatable and achievable in, in perhaps more resource poor settings. And when we, when we group individuals in the population, we tend to sort of dichotomize them into either being those who are considered healthy population or those who are prevalent cardiovascular disease. But this is really on the background of a continuum of risk. And you can think about that continuum of risk arising, for example, from an underlying atherosclerotic burden. And for each of us, we might have a sort of set point at which we become symptomatic from that atherosclerosis and, and move over into those that have prevalent disease. And when we think about the aims of, of what we're trying to do, then clearly amongst those who we consider to be free from um, having prevalent cardiovascular disease, the aim is to prevent new cases from occurring. Whereas, whereas for those that have existing disease, the aim is to prevent the, the, the manifestations, the sequelae of that disease, and to prevent recurrent disease events. In the UK, roughly 10% of the population have prevalent disease. The majority are, are considered um, free of cardiovascular disease. And our preventative approaches to everyone in the population is clearly lifestyle, so um, good diet, um, physical activity, maintaining, maintaining a, a healthy weight and so forth. And for those that have existing disease, we, we obviously additionally pharmacologically modify um, causal risk factors as an additional therapeutic approach to, to preventing um, disease recurrence. And we also extend that to individuals who, who are considered high risk, but who have yet to experience an incident cardiovascular disease. And clearly, in order for our preventative approaches to be effective, we need to have a strong understanding of the, the etiology of disease. And this study from um, 16, 17 years ago now, I think is still a landmark um, study which described the relationship of nine risk factors with risk of first MI um, in the interheart study. And they looked at the relationship not only individually, but also cumulatively. And this is what this illustration shows here. So, for example, the relationship of smoking with risk of first MI. So the y-axis is risk of odds ratio of first MI and the, and the x-axis are either our individual risk factors or their cumulative effects and various combinations of their cumulative effects. And so, for example, here we can see the effect of being a smoker versus a non-smoker on risk of MI with an odds ratio of almost three. Now, the interesting thing to my mind is when you start adding these risk factors together, then um, you get very quickly to a situation where you have enormous odds ratios. So if you if you compare somebody who has all nine risk factors to none of them, then the odds ratio of having an MI is over 300, accounting for 90% of the population attributable risk. And if we just go back one slide to these nine risk factors, I think certainly for some of them, like physical activity, psychosocial factors and diet, the I mean, there's not a consensus that those relation, that those risk factors are causal, but for the majority of the others, smoking, diabetes, lipids, obesity, 
emerging evidence for alcohol and certainly hypertension, there's a strong evidence base that these risk factors have a cause and effect relationship with the risk of, of coronary heart disease, meaning that the clinical implications are that if we were to implement preventative strategies based on our current knowledge, we would prevent the majority of heart disease cases worldwide. And I think this is a, a really poignant um, point to sort of um, reflect on. And, and one might ask, why, why are we so why are we so interested in yet further discovery if, if simply imp implementing preventative strategies based on this is enough to prevent the, the vast majority of, of, of cases of heart disease, stroke and therefore most deaths um, and globally? And I think hopefully I will help motivate this um, as, the, as, as the talk um, ensues. But clearly, if we the greatest public health benefit um, from from risk from risk factors which are normally distributed in the population arises from shifting that distribution to the left where the exposure is harmful. And what I mean by this is you might take the approach that you that you treat treat everyone everyone with systolic blood pressure of over say 140 or 160 and focus your your preventative approaches to them. And while that would have a, a modest effect on, on modifying um, the, the, the death or the mortality rates in the population, certainly the greatest benefit is when you shift that distribution um, to the left. And But the, the issue here then is that for, for situations or, or for exposures such as obesity, it's very challenging to not only initiate but then also to, to maintain changes in those quantitative traits, both at an individual level and at a population level. And then this then naturally um, come, um, leads to the, the, the question, is there a way that we can offset this harm? And in order to be able to offset the harm, we need to understand the mechanisms by which these complex exposures go on to lead to disease risk. And in order to understand those mechanisms, we need to understand cause and effect relationships between risk factors and disease and what might, what might lie in the causal pathway. And in order, to, in order to be able to reliably ascribe causal relationships to those, to those um, exposure outcome pairs, we, we rely heavily on clinical trials. So what is the status of drug development for cardiovascular disease? Well, this is an article which is now five or six years old, but it, it, at the time it nicely described where drug development was for cardiovascular disease in, compared to, in comparison to other in comparison to drugs being developed for other therapeutic indications. And what we have here on the on the y-axis is the year and then the x-axis number of compounds in clinical development and the sort of orange golden line in the middle are drugs being developed for cardiovascular disease. We can see it's relatively relatively flat, whereas other drug indications have, have kind of skyrocketed, like those being developed for oncology. And at the same time as this sort of flatlining of of drugs being developed for cardiovascular disease, there's also been this exponential increase in the cost of developing medicines, and it's now conservatively estimated to cost one billion dollars to bring a drug to market. And we can also look at, in other ways, at um, drug development. And many of us in the audience will be very familiar with this, but this is just the the pipeline by which most drugs are developed. So, following preclinical studies, they go into phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. And if there's strong evidence or, or sufficient evidence from your phase three clinical trial of clinical efficacy, then the sponsor will put in a, a marketing authorization application, which is what the MAA stands for. What we can do is look at what is the probability of success? What is the probability of obtaining or achieving a marketing authorization at each stage of this um, pipeline? So for drugs entering phase one clinical trials, we can see that 7% of them will obtain a marketing authorization in other words, fewer than one in 10 drugs succeed from phase one through to marketing authorization. When you get to phase two um, clinical trials, because there's been attrition of those drugs that have, 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 um, have failed at an, at an early stage, the probability of success goes up to 15%. And then once you get to phase three, um, the probability of success is roughly is up over 60%. Um, but it's just worth reflecting that roughly 10 years ago, um, even when you got through to phase three, so you'd, you'd managed to run the gauntlet all the way to, through to phase three, the probability of being able to, of, of achieving results from your phase three clinical trial in order to put in an application for marketing authorization was akin to flipping a coin. So quite a, quite a high risk process. Other features are that it takes roughly 10 years from entry in humans through to marketing authorization. 
And, and as I already mentioned in the, in the last slide, it costs roughly one billion dollars to to develop a drug. Now, what we can do is, if you just go back to this slide, these are summary estimates across multiple drugs being developed for different indications, and we can then um, dissect that further into looking at drugs being developed for specific indications, and we can see that amongst drugs being developed for cardiovascular disease, the, the probability of success is the lowest among the group for, well, it, it is amongst the lowest for the group for both phase one, phase two, and also phase three clinical trials. And I suspect reasons for this include that we already have such effective drugs for cardiovascular disease that the bar is set that high in order to, 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 to take, to take um, drugs forward into the next step and then also into marketing authorization. But we can explore re reasons for failure, um, sort of zooming out. And this um, pie chart here illustrates reasons for failures in phase two and three um, clinical trials. And we can see that, and, th and this is agnostic to therapeutic indications. So this is um, looking again at all, at all drugs being developed. And we can see that the majority of failures, roughly half of failures are due to lack of efficacy and a quarter are due to are due to safety issues. And if we add these two together, then, then we can say that roughly three quarters of failures arise due to either lack of efficacy or adverse drug reactions. And importantly, those can be quantified or predicted um, through human genetics. Not always, but they can, they can sometimes be. And indeed, this article from 2015 and Jack highlighted the potential value of Mendelian randomization as applied to proteomics and metabolomics as providing another evidence layer um, to helping us guide um, which compounds we take forward into, into development. So why are we so reliant on clinical trials? Um, many of us will be familiar with this sort of hierarchy of evidence whereby we place clinical trials above observational studies in the evidence base that is that can be that, or, or the reliability of the estimates which which um, which are derived from these, from these studies. I'm not saying that all clinical trials are better than all observational studies, but I think it's fair to say that if you do a clinical trial to the best of our ability, then 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 our ability to ascribe causal effects from the data that are, that we obtain is is much more reliably done so from a clinical trial than it is from an observational study. And the reason for this is that observational epidemi epidemiology is in intrinsically constrained by issues of confounding and reverse causation. And by, by randomizing to the drug and, or the comparator group in a randomized controlled trial, we, we, we should be free or we should free ourselves potentially from the concerns of confounding and the fact that there's an intervention which precedes the incident disease afterwards means that reverse causality should be should be abolished. And for these reasons, um, clinical trials are rightfully the gold standard for for validating the clinical efficacy of modifying a drug target. So that, that's not in doubt. But the, the, the issue then arises that there's a plethora of independent risk factors. And this is an article from 2005 that described the number of articles per year that contain the term independent risk factor or independent predictor in the title or abstract. And we can see this exponential increase. And clearly this article was published almost 16 years ago now, and which is why the x-axis stops at 2005. And if we update that to present day, so this black line is where that article stopped off. Um, we update this to present day, we can see that this um, cumulative, this um, exponential increase has, has has persisted. And that's not surprising when you think about all the discoveries in the past 15 years with genomics, proteomics, um, rich phenotyping and large biobanks and, and so forth. So there's a plethora of independent risk factors. This number is increasing and certainly it would be naive to think that these are all picking up new independent risk factors, but certainly the evidence is that there, there, there are a, a lot of these and clearly while we might be interested in whether or not they play a causal role in disease, and because of the features of, our, of the clinical trials which we described, um, it's not it's just not practical to do a clinical trial on each and every one of these potential independent risk factors that, that, that we are interested in. And so this is where we, we need an additional source of randomized evidence. And, and before I come on to describe Mendelian randomization, I just want to take a moment to describe um, or just to highlight how far this field has come on in the past past 20 years. So this is a, an infographic from a nature piece from Mark McCarthy, Cecilia Lindgren, 
and colleagues from last year, and it just highlights um, how far we've come. For example, in 2000, the draft human genome sequence was made available. 2000, 2005, the very first GWAS was conducted, which is 15 to 16 years ago. It's, it's remarkable how, how, how recent um, these developments are. Um, we, and the first um, UK biobank study was GWAS was complete, or the GWAS was completed in in 2017, so four years ago. It's um, so remarkable achievements, as we can see by the the number of um, GWAS uh, signals that have been discovered in, in recent years. And so, with recognition that there's, there really has been a revolution in genomics in the past 20 years, the question then is. What is the clinical translation? How do we how do we move this forward into improving how we treat um, patients and prevent disease from occurring? And clearly, there, there are lots of different ways this can be done. The three main reasons that that or the three main opportunities that that to my mind include opportunities for polygenic prediction of disease, identifying genetic effect modifiers of treatment response, and then exploring. Um, causal relationships of, of biomarkers of drug targets with disease through Mendelian randomization. And, and much of the rest of the talk is going to be focusing on Mendelian randomization and its applications. Um, I'm not going to delve into um, intricate details on the assumptions, how we conduct it and how necessarily we interpret MR. Um, but, I but I will say that this is a genetic epidemiological technique that allows us to make causal deductions, principally owing to the fact that the way that we inherit DNA from our parents shares analogy to the way in which drugs are, 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 um, are, are randomized in a clinical trial. So at each location in our DNA, we inherit one copy from our father and one copy from our mother. And whichever copy we inherit from either side is randomly allocated to us like the throw of a dice. And what this means is if you group individuals in the population by their gene by their genotype, um, if, the, if that genotype goes on to modify a, a biomarker such as LDL cholesterol, um, then we can compare disease um, disease event risk rates in this genotype this genotypically defined group to this genotypically defined group, and we can we can um, ascribe any disease um, associations or, or disease risk differences um, to, to arise due to that biomarker. And, and that has an analogy with, with a randomized controlled trial, where there's randomization to the drug or the comparator group. And that randomization should allow the, the comparison of disease risk amongst the groups um, free from confounding. And, and in a Mendelian randomization study, the fact that there is um, that that um, non-somatic or germline DNA is is not modified through our lifetime. Um, there's an opportunity by which disease which we experience um, through, throughout our lives can go back in time and modify that, and therefore there should be no opportunity for, for reverse causation. Just as in a clinical trial, the intervention preceding um, incident disease means that there should be no mechanism by which by which there's reverse causation in, in the clinical trial context. And what this allows us to do is to reappraise our, our hierarchy of evidence, placing Mendelian randomization at the interface between observational and interventional epidemiology, allowing us to focus on which biomarkers, which drug targets we take forward into clinical trial setting, and which of those we mothball on the basis of lack of credible um, genetic evidence to support its causation and obviously the triangulation of that with other other sources of data. Now, I think it's fair to say that Mendelian randomization has become an established epidemiological approach. And it's this um, infographic on the right or this bar chart just illustrates the number of articles published um, um, per year. And the reason why it's become, I think, why it's become so established is, is partly because people are, are increasingly realizing its potential but also because of the fact that it is incredibly feasible to do it now, owing to the availability of large scale GWAS genotyping data. And this exists both for large case control studies of disease, for example, cardiogram plus, plus C4D for coronary heart disease, meaning that, that um, studies are typically adequately powered in order to detect a relationship between a, a genetically predicted exposure and outcome. But also the fact that large biobanks, such as UK Biobank and China Korea Biobank are genotyped, 
um, allows exploratory phenome-wide association studies, allowing us to conduct analyses in, in a more hypothesis-free manner, which provides oppor opportunities for new discovery. And in addition to this, there's been a lot of progress in, in methods so that we are now be able to address what is one of the main um, issues or, or potential limitations of Mendelian randomization, that being the, the potential for bias arising from genetic pleiotropy. And, and the opportunity to conduct MR analyses through, through pipelines or, or platforms such as MR base, meaning that it's possible to conduct analysis without ever downloading data onto your computer. Now, um, I started in MR field around about 2000, late 2000, so 2009. And I remember, um, for example, at, at the Alcohol adh one b project, we had to um, email letters of interest or collaboration out to about 40 to 50 studies. And then each of these studies would then run us data or R script on site, send us their summary estimates, we would then collate them, clean them, meta-analyze them and so forth. And so to answer a single question might take three to four years by the time all the data had come in and analyzed and and and, and reanalyzed re and so forth. Whereas now it's feasible to do that in five, 10, 15 minutes in MR base, which just really shows how, how far the field has come and how, how, how much more data are available and so forth. So, I want to take a moment just to think about what the kinds of studies we are doing in Mendelian randomization and the implications for this on how we generate our genetic instruments, how we interpret the data and how we and how we use this um, to inform either clinical trials or our understanding of the of the, the causes of of disease. And this is really um, underpinned by thinking about what is the primary exposure. So if the primary exposure is complex biomarker, and what I mean by that is something like LDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, body mass index, then we can conduct an MR analysis and ask ourselves the question, for example, does do increases in body mass index lead to higher risk of heart disease? And there's several strands of evidence from, from human genetics that that certainly is the case. And what and what, what this allows us to um, to to um, to think about is if we shift the, the distribution of body mass index in the population to the left, then what 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 in, what what um, impact does this have on disease risk? So in some ways, estimating public estimating the effect of public health interventions. Now, if we want to modify that complex biomarker pharmacologically, then typically we would we, we investigate a drug target that is that is upstream of that. And what we can do through Mendelian randomization is answer several questions. For example, we can ask, does modifying, if I use a genetic genetic instrument for my drug target, does that lead to alterations in the complex biomarker that, that I'm interested in? For example, BMI, LDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure. Then does, does I can also ask the question, does modifying my drug target through my genetic instrument lead to an alteration in disease risk? And if so, is that commensurate with the with the reduction or the, the, the difference in biomarker that's achieved from my genetic instrument for my drug target. In other words, it might be possible to predict findings of a clinical trial. So here I'm, I'm trying to sort of um, highlight the, the different, um, the different um, forms of Mendelian randomization, principally by the exposure, whether it's a complex biomarker and a drug target. And, and I, I think there's several reasons why this is um, this is important to do. First of all, it's important from what what is the underlying question and motivation. So, for example, for a complex biomarker, when dealing randomization, the question is: Does this biomarker cause disease? The motivation might be, as a, as I mentioned, for public health um, reasons, but also to shed light on the causes of disease and identify biomarkers in which we might wish to intervene. And this is in contrast to a drug target. Mendelian randomization um, analysis, where the question might be, does modifying this drug target alter the risk of disease, making a phase three clinical trial likely to succeed, with the motivation being the development of new therapies for the prevention of incident and recurrent disease and disease-related sequelae. So this is one reason, th th this slide highlights one reason why I think we need to think more and more about what is our primary exposure um, of interest, but equally, um, another reason is that there is an uh, inherent difference in the genetic architecture of these traits. So most drugs, 
target proteins. And the genetic architecture of proteins is such that, such that we, can, we can describe um, um, SNP single nucleotide polymorphisms that associate with these proteins based on whether they lie in or around the gene encoding that protein, in which case they are cis-acting SNP, or whether they're in discrete parts or other parts of the genome, in which case they are trans-acting SNPs. And that is in contrast to these complex traits such as metabolites, such as um, systolic blood pressure, such as body mass index, where the genetic architecture is inherently polygenic. In other words, there's not a single gene that encodes a complex biomark, and as a result, when we're constructing our genetic instruments, we need, we should really um, take um, select SNPs from across the genome rather than focusing on, for example, um, SNPs in an individual gene or locus. So this is a, a, a as I said before on, on the previous slides, I think as a, um, increasingly we're going to be thinking about. Or I suggest being to think about MRs focusing on what is the primary exposure of interest and and I've talked about the the purpose and the motivation and here is a, a biological or genetic reason for why why this why this distinction is important um, and I'm going to explain this through an example which many of us in the audience will be familiar with and uh, but I hope that it, it's, it helps to sort of clarify some of these concepts so the emerging risk factor um, collaboration data um, 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 explored the relationship of, of um, lipids and apolipoproteins and risk of heart disease. And this figure on the left hand side here um, shows the, the concentration of HDL on the X axis and the hazard ratio of heart disease on the Y axis. And um, um, we can see the, the minimally adjusted and the fully adjusted models here um, um, consistent with an inverse relationship between HDL cholesterol and heart disease. And understandably, this led to the hypothesis that that increases in HDL cholesterol might be cardioprotective and and fuel drug development programs such as um, therapeutic inhibitors of CTP, which are which is an enzyme involved in the metabolism of HDL. Now, what we can do is ask ourselves first of all the question through Mendelian randomization: Does HDL cause heart disease? And this is work which we did um, about five years ago now. Um, which John White led, and it, it explored the the um, the different effect estimates that we get through Mendelian randomization, and we can see that. Um, so this is um, an instrument for HDL cholesterol. And um, we have 140 SNPs which were which were selected in our in our instrument. And if you conduct a naive univariable or what we call a conventional um, analysis, um, then you, you, we do obtain estimates which are consistent with the potential. Um, protective effect, but un unfortunately for us, our genetic instrument suffers from horizontal pleiotropy. Um, and when we when we, we re-estimate the underlying causal relationship through MR Egger, which not only quantifies the presence of horizontal pleiotropy, but then can potentially correct for it, then our effect estimate diminishes towards the null, consistent with this inverse association um, arising due to a form of error such as confounding. Um, we took this forward one step further in, in a study from last year published in PLOS Medicine, um, where Tom Richardson um, GWAST and, um, and analysed um, data in the UK Biobank for the apolipoprotein uh, apolipoproteins uh, and lipid traits, and this, these just show the Manhattan plots for the different um, the different apolipoproteins and lipids. But what this shows on the right hand side is a Venn diagram showing specificity, or, or rather lack of specificity, of SNPs with individual traits. And for example, we can see that if we focus on the HDL cholesterol, we can see that this sort of red balloon. Um, indicates those SNPs that have been have been identified to associate with HDL cholesterol at GWAS significance, and depending on on which um, which group um, the numbers are in, th those SNPs associate with one or more of these um, lipid or apolipoprotein entities, and so we can see that actually the majority of these HDL associated SNPs are not uniquely associated with HDL cholesterol. And I would I, I would I'd be very careful about saying that, that these 112 SNPs do uniquely associate with HDL cholesterol because the, the thresholds by which um, SNPs enter each of these bins is a GWAS threshold. And so, so as soon as we start relaxing that threshold, then this number of 112 will, will diminish toward um to, towards um zero very quickly. 
In other words, hopefully what this figure illustrates is that these SNPs that associates with lipid and apolipid proteins are really quite pleiotropic, which speaks to the necessity to take that pleiotropy into account when we conduct our, our analyses. And so using many more SNPs this time, um, again, Tom Richardson conducted this sort of naive univariable analysis for HDL, showing just as John White had done, that there's an inver a, a potential um, naively um, attributable inverse um, causal relationship. But actually, when you take into account the fact that these HDL SNPs also associate with other lipid traits in this multivariable analysis, in this case, we included apolipid protein B, then we can see that the HDL association diminishes towards the null, again, consistent with that observational association, that inverse observational association arising due to, due to a form of error such as confounding. So what we've done so far is these, those are two separate studies which, which explored whether or not high density lipoprotein cholesterol um, plays a causal role in heart disease. And this, can, this um, takes the form of a polygenic instrument. So we're selecting SNPs from across the gene, the genome associated with the HDL cholesterol, and we implement the, them through Mendelian randomization. And we say that, uh, that we say that, or the interpretation is that, well, we say that HDL is not causal, and interpretation thus is that increasing HDL cholesterol is unlikely to lower the risk of heart disease. But I mean, th some of these studies were only conducted last year, and that, that's. And in, in, the, in the meantime, there's been a, more than a decade of drug development in, in therapies that increase HDL cholesterol through mechanisms such as inhibiting CTP. So how do we reconcile the fact that CTP inhibitors um, increase HDL um, and some also lower risk of heart disease? For example, the, the most notable one being conducted um, by colleagues here at CTSU of, of, the, of the CTP inhibitor anisotropin, which did increase HDL and also lowered risk of heart disease. So how do we reconcile this with, with our phenotypic complex biomarker Mendelian randomization analysis, which doesn't support a causal, a protective role of HDL cholesterol and heart disease? Well, it's like I say, the, our HDL instrument here is, is polygenic. Now, at least one or more of the SNPs in our HDL cholesterol will be in or around the CTP locus, allowing us to use it as a drug target analysis. So, um, so we have one or more SNPs in and around the CTP locus, allowing us to predict the, the pharmacological effects of inhibiting CTP. And, and certainly our genetic instrument for CTP is strongly associated with risk of heart disease. And, and we, we, we can also say that our genetic instrument strongly increases HDL cholesterol, but we know from this analysis here that that relationship between HDL cholesterol and heart disease is not causal, um, but that, 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 that genetic variant, our CTP instrument, also has other effects on other lipids and apolipid proteins, and it's, it's more than likely that that causal effect of CTP on heart disease risk is mediated through ApoB or through other atherogenic um, lipoproteins, meaning that what we can conclude here is that drugs that target CTP lower heart disease risk through ApoB. So hopefully what this um, example has illustrated is that the effects of drug targets may differ from the biomarker they were intended to modify. And this can be thought of as target mediated pleiotropy. But unlike forms of horizontal pleiotropy of Mendelian randomization, this form of pleiotropy is actually, should not lead to bias and actually is a, is a feature of drug targets. Mendelian randomization. So, for example, just to illustrate the concept, here we have our CTP instrument or our CTP drug target, which was designed on the basis to increase HDL cholesterol and by doing so to lower the risk of heart disease. And the fact that we do see a, a heart disease association from CTP, um, rather than it being attributable to HDL, it's, it's due to an alternative pathway, um, which, which might be ApoB or LDL cholesterol. So this distinction between drug target MR and complex biomarker MR is, is, um, is important for, for thinking about sort of thinking about a framework of MR in this way. And while there might be um, um, size in the audience of yet another complexity to add to, to Mendelian randomization, I think this really um, affords us opportunities for new discovery and rethinking how we think about the, our analytical framework um, for, for, for disease. 
And, and this and, and some other thoughts are, are put together in this editorial form a couple of years ago, which highlighted that um, we can quantify target media's effects, including both those that are intended and adverse to human genetics. But clearly we cannot quantify off target effects, but there are ways in which we can we can approximate, uh, we, we can um, we can uh, potentially explore their presence. And just for, just sticking with the adverse events example um, for um, in this slide, we can see, and I'm clearly sticking with CTP for consistency of example. So we have a genetic instrument for a drug target. If that if that drug target goes on to lead to an adverse event, the AE here through a, a mechanism based um, pathway, then our drug, which is developed to modify a drug target, will also exhibit that adverse event by virtue of it being target mediated. And no matter what drug we develop um, for to, to modify that drug target, they, they also will likely um, display the adverse event. In contrast, if that adverse event is a, a feature of the drug rather than our drug target, then, then our genetic instrument won't be able to quantify it. Um, but importantly, it might be possible to develop um, new drugs which do modify that drug target, which do not um, exhibit the adverse events, but which do exhibit the benefit of that drug target being that, that being the reason why that, that target is, 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 ha has been developed. And just thinking about a, a worked example here in human genetics where we we applied human genetics to, to really uh, um, pr provide more information on a question which uh, from which there really wasn't much resolution from the from from the data made made available. So sclerostin is a protein um, which is involved in bone metabolism, and its inhibition is a new um, a, a, a new um, th therapeutic um, opportunity to prevent fracture um, as a consequence of osteoporosis. And certainly the, the monoclonal antibody inhibitors have been developed um, that, that effectively lower fracture risk, but for which there, there are concerns of potential excess risk of cardiovascular disease. And this plot shows a cumulative um, meta-analysis. And um, for example, this is these are data just from the ARCH trial. And um, these are data from the ARCH plus the bridge trial. And then these are data from the ARCH plus bridge plus frame trial. And the dotted line purely indicates where um, the, the sequence of events um, or the, the, the moment at which additional data were made available to, to the Food and Drug Administration um, from the sponsor when they, when they filed their dossier. And you can see that there is that before the, before the, the, filing, the filing, there was um, total 25 events, a point estimate of almost, almost three, but really wide imprecise 95% confidence intervals and with addition of the frame trial um, the, the the point estimate weakened um, and included the null and, and certainly we might naively interpret that as then lo no longer being evidence of an association or well you might interpret that and say well actually there, there still is evidence consistent with the potential harm and so what Jonas did as this is Jonas Bovin's work which he did as part of his PhD supervised by um, Cecilia Lindgren and myself, what, what Jonas did was to take genetic variants in the SOS T locus, so conducting a drug target Mendelian randomization analysis um, as, a, as a means to provide further information here to, to tell us whether or not these, this is a, um, a, a real target mediated effect of therapeutic inhibition of sclerostin. So this figure illustrates the summary of evidence from randomized controlled trials um, of of um, what which is our monoclonal antibody inhibitor of sclerostin, and for example, we can see the the, the large reduction in risk of of fracture, um, which is the primary indication for for this for this um, for this medicinal product, and we can see the potentially higher risks of heart disease. Um, which I showed you in the last slide, that, that just illustrates both points for transparency. And then this is our major adverse coronary events, which adds ischemic stroke and, and a broader definition of coronary heart disease. So what Jonas did, like I said, was to take SNPs in and around the T locus, strongly associated with bone mineral density, scale them to the same increase in bone mineral density seen in phase two and three clinical trials of this monoclonal antibody, and derived an estimate for fracture risk which we can see here, 
which is consistent with the estimate from clinical trials. If anything, it's slightly stronger, which you might expect because the mental anonymization approximates lifetime exposures to, to, to an exposure. Um, um, but obviously the question is, what, are the, what is the relationship of our genetic instrument um, with coronary events? Um, and this, this is where the, the data are consistent or supportive of cardiovascular or coronary events being a, a, a potentially real um, target mediated consequence of therapeutic inhibition of, of sclerostin. And so you can then take this one step forward and if you just ignore this figure here for the, for the moment, time being. So we have the drug target, this is sclerostin, and we have a complex biomarker which is intended to modify, so bone mineral density, and, and we have fracture risk here. If we swap out fracture risk now for heart disease, we can ask ourselves, um, does sclerostin or does um, does inhibition of sclerostin lead to heart disease, higher heart disease risk through bone mineral density, or is it through an alternative pathway? And so we can see here, for example, for heart disease, these are our estimates from our SOS T instruments, and this is our MR estimate from um, I think it's over 200 SNPs for bone mineral density. And yes, I would really like to see the 95% confidence intervals be much narrower here, but I think it's fair to say that this is consistent with soft T having a, 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 a certainly having a, a mechanism based effect on heart disease. That's what, what the previous data showed us and it being mediated through bone mineral density. I think the data for type 2 diabetes where I should say that the, the work also identified signals with type 2 diabetes and some and some risk factors such as blood pressure and waist of ratio, um, which which speaks to potential mechanisms by which by which then that, that excess cardiovascular disease um, arises. Um, but I should say that the diabetes certainly seems much more consistent, where again, we have consistency of our drug target um, um, relationship with risk of type 2 diabetes, as we do with our bone mineral density, again, potentially consistent with, this, with bone mineral density lying on the causal pathway um, to disease. So, I just want to take a couple of moments to think about where we've been in MR and where we're going. So historically, we would look at one exposure and one outcome at a time to answer a single question of importance in hopefully a well-powered um, study, but there is naturally less potential for novel discovery. And I think going, going in the future, we're more and more going to be looking at multiple exposures and multiple outcomes simultaneously. And while this does come at the cost of um, a hit on power, this, this provides opportunities for, for um, hypothesis-free um, um, discoveries. I just want to highlight some work which we um, published towards the end of last year, Nature Metabolism, which is from the Scallop Consortium. Um, these are studies that have GWAS genotyping and have one or more of the O-Link proteomic panels quantified. And this is the GWAS of one of those um, cardiovascular disease um, protein panels in 30,000 individuals, work led by Lassie Fulkerson and Anders Malerstig. And by, by virtue of the, of, protein, of the protein being so um, proximal to the genome, um, in 30,000 individuals, there were almost um, there were over 450 hits. What I mean by that is, is GWAS, GWAS hits. And, and this isn't because those proteins are highly correlated, so we're just picking up the, the same signal in different ways. The proteins are, are actually rather rather non-correlated as um, in, 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 in the O-Link um, uh, um, panels as compared to thinking about something like the NMR metabolomics where there is very high correlation between, between a lot of the traits. Interesting thing, the, the minority of these traits, of these, sorry, of these um, genetic instruments were in, um, in the gene encoding the, the protein. Now, what Chin Wang um, did, and she's a postdoc visitor at Oxford that I've been working with for a couple of years, as part of this work, what Chin, um, Chin did was to take these 90 proteins and explore their, their effects on multiple disease, um, multiple continuous risk factors for disease and also diseases. I'm not going to go through this um, in detail, but it kind of illustrates um, a sort of tapestry of causation and, and what and where, where things might be going over the future. And like I say, rather than going in detail, I want to sort of draw on themes. The themes being that where we um, identify or recapitulate the, the effects of drug targets that are either under development or that have existing marketing authorizations, then this acts as both at a positive control, but also further fuel for, for those drugs that are under, under development. When we discover 
new protein to disease relationships where they haven't previously been categorized and this might motivate the development of therapies for those indications. And finally, where we characterize additional disease associations of drugs with, with existing marketing authorization, this serves as an opportunity for repositioning. And I think a really good example of this um, um, is interleukin-6 receptor and, and COVID-19, where again, Jonas Boven's work from September last year, published in Lancet Rheumatology, um, was consistent with um, therapeutic inhibition of interleukin-6 receptor being of benefit to patients with COVID-19 and certainly since then, we've had two, um, lar two large RCTs, um, notably the recovery trial recently, um, 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 demonstrating pharmacological inhibition of interleukin-6 receptor um, being effective um, in, in that setting. So I spent a lot of time describing why I think um, we need to think more about MR and the, what, is the, what is the primary exposure under investigation? Is it a complex biomarker? Is it a drug target? And every example I've shown so far, the drug target is upstream of the complex phenotype. And I, I just want to um, um, explore very briefly that this doesn't, this isn't always the case. And in fact, it can be the other way around and we can, we can flip it the other way around as an opportunity for discovery. And one way, to, just one way to motivate this is through um, the, the 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 global issue of of obesity, which is um, really increasing worldwide. And these this this um, those two slides just illustrate um, how how um, um, adults' body mass index is really increasing on a global scale. And ignore where the, where the data is missing, which is grey. That that just um, it's, it's more the fact that we we see these large increases in body mass index. So obesity is increasing um, and we know that it's causally related to multiple diseases. And as I mentioned before, um, sustained, um, sustained weight loss is very challenging both at an, in, an individual and population level. So is there an alternative approach that we can, that we can take um, um, to, to try and offset the harm that arises from from these complex exposures that are modifying, that are challenging to modify at the population level. And so here we have our, our genetic instrument for body mass index, and we, we, we show, uh, we show um, well, lots of people have shown that body mass index causes heart disease um, from, from, from quite a few different studies. Um, and th what we can then think about is what lies on the causal pathway from body mass index to heart disease, and certainly we know about things like systolic blood pressure, inflammation, triglycerides, but if we just focus for a moment on proteins, then potentially we, we might identify that, say, body mass index leads to alterations in the concentrations of circulating proteins. And if we do identify that relationship, then we can take that one step further and then ask ourselves, um, does that protein go on to lead to altered risk of um, disease and by doing so begin to sort of tease apart, pick away at the mediating mechanisms by which um, complex exposure such as BMI leads to altered risk of disease. And if you think about it, you do, we do that on one, on one case, we can do this across multiple intermediaries and, and potentially we might identify multiple intermediaries, some of which might be pharmacologically modifiable. And by doing so, provide new ways of thinking about how do we um, how do we diminish the impact of, of body mass index on disease? Well, potentially one way is to pharmacologically modify these, these causal intermediaries um, and, and therefore offset the risk. And this is work in, in that um, Nature Metabolism paper where we compared the observational and the MR estimate of BMI on the 90 proteins and and we can see that um, this illustrates two things. First, that BMI does influence proteins, circulating proteins. Um, and secondly, that, that observational associations tend to be recapitulated through, through estimates, um, through, through human genetics, through Mendelian randomization. And then Huan Ji Pang took this one step forward using data from the China Kudubi Biobank, um, where she initially explored the observational relationship of body mass index with these proteins. And this is a different proteomic panel. I think it's just worth highlighting that this is in only 700 individuals in the China Kudubi Biobank and speaks to the to the what speaks to the, the opportunity to obtain quite reliable data from, from, from relatively small sample sizes. And so this shows the observational, the sort of cross-sectional association of body mass index with these proteins. 
this then illustrates the the effect of of BMI when when, the, when these estimates are re, recalculated through Mendelian randomization, and certainly there are some situations where the association appears to be directionally opposite. But by and large, um, the observational associations are recapitulated through Mendelian randomization. And then what Wangji did was to look at the the association of these proteins with incident disease. So amongst these 700 individuals in the China Kudavir Biobank, some of them have gone on to experience incident cardiovascular disease. And these estimates just illustrate those, 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 um, those, those relationships. And again, generally consistent. So where BMI increases a protein, that then tends to be um, increased in, in Mendelian randomization analysis, and then that protein then goes on to, on the whole, it tends to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And while you might claim that these associations here are simply due to sort of per pervasive confounding, which could well be the case, ideally what we'd like to be able to do is add a panel D where we have MR of these proteins onto CVD, providing us with the sort of the full circle, the full sweep of data, allowing us to then really have reliable evidence of, of these potential mediators. And that's where um, reliable um, instruments for proteins, for example, from the Scallop Consortium um, and other initiatives will, will be really valuable. And that's just um, that's just a reference for, for Huangji's paper, which he published last year in JAMA Cardiology. So bringing, bringing things to, um, to a summary, um, clearly cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and uh, a reliable understanding of etiology is key to, to effective approaches to prevention and treatment. Vanamese study designs um, are essential for, um, um, for, for, for ascribing causal effects and clinical trials are the gold standard, rightly so, but we really need to reserve them for those biomarkers which are most likely to succeed and I think it's fair to say that MR can be used as a filter by which we, we decide which biomarkers we take forward or which drug targets we take forward into, into clinical trials. Um, as I've described it provides us opportunities to increase our understanding of, of potential mediators and, and there's also opportunities for drug target development and I'm just going to finish off in this slide which is from a uh, Nature Reviews Cardiology um, piece which hopefully will be coming out in the next few weeks and it just illustrates different examples of where we can potentially think about folding in human genetics to the different phases of drug development. So for example, even before we enter humans, having genetic data to support the drug target in terms of both credible evidence of causation but also conducting phenomide association studies so we have an understanding of potential adverse events um, um, which, which might arise from pharmacological modification of that, of that um, drug target. Um, before we enter phase one, we can conduct MR against the, um, um, for the proteome metabolome and thus rather than relying on a single biomarker to gauge um, drug response, we can have a, a we can have a, a, a repertoire or, or multiple um, biomarkers which we use to, to um, as a measure of therapeutic response. For phase two, we can think about other drug target biomarker pairs where we where we can use that information as an opportunity to think about how do we how do we scale our MR estimates so that we are we are reliably predicting um, potential um, effects from those clinical trials and. When we get to phase three, thinking about adaptive designs and enriching individuals who are more likely to respond on the basis of, of, of possessing certain genetic variants that, that makes them more likely to respond to therapy. But equally, and, and I think it's fair to say that pharmacogenics is, is in quite a nascent form, but I think that's certainly an area that's really going to flourish over coming years with, with well phenotyped studies on information on, on drug treatment and response and so forth. Um, and thinking about, again, sticking with adaptive designs, where we have a composite primary endpoint consisting of five or six different individual constituents or components, if our MR analysis shows that one or more of those components is only weakly associated with that drug target, we might modify that composite endpoint to remove them and, and therefore avoid the avoid a dilution of, of, the, of the overall um, um, result from that clinical trial. In phase four, thinking about where there are spontaneous reports of adverse drugs, bringing in genetics as a form of triangulation. The example of sclerostin, although it wasn't um, a spontaneous report, it was actually data from phase three trials, kind of provides a, an example of how that can be useful. And then thinking about repurposing opportunities, and I've already described the example of, 
of the work on interleukin-6 receptor and, and COVID-19. And very finally, um, work from Chris Nelson and Neelish Samani published in Nature Genetics a few years ago suggested that um, that focusing in this area here, where there's early sub support of causation, so where drug targets have genetic support, they're twice as likely to succeed to marketing authorization. And I think once we start layering in genetics at, at multiple stages, I think this is really beginning only scratching at the surface of what can be done. This doubling is likely to, to increase substantially. And I think it's a really exciting um, um, opportunity um, that we have. And with that, I'll finish and thank you all very much for listening and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we very much enjoyed that both current status and a walk through the future the years of MR in particular. So I hope you can see me and hear me, Michael. Um, we are just about at time, but maybe we could send you one or two questions which have come in. Um, maybe this is a, a tricky one, so I don't know how you can summarize your answer to this one. I guess the question is very logical though. The, the, the person is asking, you know, let's say you've demonstrated in an MR study that mm. a, a target looks attractive for a trial. So you want to move ahead to your trial. Can you and how can you translate that information into actually a sample size for a trial? You know, how do you go from the, uh, the likelihood of benefit to actually building a trial around it and how big it needs to be? So I think this speaks to the issue about scaling where uh, drug targets of complex biomarker MR will typically overestimate the effect you would get from a, from a short trial. And I think where, where you have a new biomarker or new drug target that is modifying a complex, complex biomarker that have previously hasn't been explored, I think that that's, that's, that is a really tricky question to answer. But in the, let's say for the for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. we are developing a, a dr another drug to modify LDL cholesterol or ApoB, then there's a plethora of evidence where we, we have the trial data, we have the genetics data, we can say that there's an approximately threefold larger effect from the AMR as compared to the clinical trial. And therefore you can scale your genetically predicted effect from your clinical trial by that scaling factor and then use that, feed that into how you would conduct a normal power calculation in the clinical trial. And um, so I think we can, yeah, but where, where, where there are examples of that complex biomarker um, having already succeeded, then that's that's what can be done where there's existing trial data, where, where, where it's a completely new biomarker, then I think that that's more of a challenge. Um, yeah, okay, agreed. And I guess there's some lovely examples from Brian Ferens, for example, looking at lipoprotein little a, and he can, you know, calculate from that. You need a drug which lowers the biomarker by at least X, and therefore you can work along those lines. So thank you. That's very helpful. One final question, slightly tongue in cheek, I think, from David Hunter. Um, he <coughs> mentions Sec Catharison's paper from 2012, looking at HDL and MI, um, yeah. which, as David says, did not account for horizontal pleiotropy and showed no relationship. So David says, did he just get lucky? Or do you think it also played a role that he was just looking at, you know, the first dozen kind of HDL snips um, at the time? Any any thoughts on that? So my understanding of that paper is that they actually removed snips that didn't associate with LDL or triglycerides at a, at a specified value. So in effect, what they were doing is what we used to do in the old days of MR before we had things like MR ergo, multivariable MR, is you would, you would try to generate these instruments that were specific for your primary exposure based on arbitrary thresholds of whether or not they associated with additional traits. And um, the beauty of, of, the, of the methodological development such as multivariable MR, MR EGR, is that you don't then need to apply these apply arbitrary thresholds, you can you can apply, you, you, you can conduct these analyses which which um, should yield more, more robust estimates. Okay, and now actually I'm going to take prerogative and just ask one final thing because you brought up the hierarchy of evidence and, and kind of positioned MR in, in the middle, which looked very nice and made a lot of sense. So I was on a guideline committee a while ago where the guideline really struggled with alcohol and what to recommend. And mm -hmm. some people looked at your MR paper from a few years before and said the evidence is clear. We need to be a, make a clear stand that alcohol is bad, causes yeah. CVD. Um, whereas others were not yet persuaded, kind of a new methodology, people were uncomfortable. So 
don't you think there's a, a growing role for MR even on guidelines because some trials can't be done or won't be done? Yeah, I agree. The, the issue, I mean, having been first author on an ARC paper, paper, I'm obviously, I can't give an unbiased appraisal of it, but I think it's fair to say the issue with that study is there's a single point estimate and that really applies to the population average. So on average, if everyone drinks less, then the risk of heart disease is lower. But what Iona Millwood and colleagues at CKB did in their CKB, where there's much more powerful instruments, is to explore the relationship across the distribution, um, which provides much more powerful information in the context of, of something which a clinical trial, although lovely to do, such as the MAC-15 trial, which was abandoned, hasn't is unlikely to ever happen. So I think I agree where, where there are where there are really powerful data and very strong genetic instruments, such as the ALDH2 from, from Iona and, and the CKB um, group, I think MR does play a, play a, play a, an important role there. Okay, especially, especially in the context where clinical mm. trial is either unethical or or incredibly difficult to achieve. Okay, excellent, great, and a good point to note to end on. So. Just uh, from all the audience, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time and walking us through your lecture today. We've enjoyed it a lot. And to everybody listening, there's a couple uh, talks in the next couple of weeks to finish off this term seminars and wishing you the very best of the afternoon. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.